Well, thank you all very much for making room in what I know is a, a very busy schedule for another talk. <clears throat> I first of all wanted to just uh, introduce myself <laughs> to, to those of you who might not know me as well. I'm uh, one of uh, three elected co-chairs of the International Pulsar Timing Array Gravitational Wave Working Group. And I'm known for three things in particular. For extracting statistics from the gravitational background, from using galaxy surveys in a multi-messenger effort to try to understand where supermassive black hole binaries are located, and also um, for being the first person to look into anisotropy in the gravitational wave background. So I've color-coded these uh, for, for ease, um, and you'll see these a, bit, a little bit throughout my talk. But the, mon the one uh, main question that I'm trying to answer or to address is how do supermassive black holes merge? So we believe that the gravitational wave background will be detected in about five years from now, and so the work that I've done into extracting astrophysics will be really important in the inside of this detection. For continuous waves, uh, again, this is in five years after the detection of the background, so I've done really important work here. And anisotropy comes at around the same time as LISA applies. And so LISA is going to be a gravitational wave detector in space. So the reason that I think that this work is going to be really interesting for people at the CCA um, is because it touches on most of what the groups here work on, in particular, gravitational waves. So it's the discovery of the gravitational wave background, of continuous gravitational waves, anisotropy in the background, using a method which is completely different from LIGO, uh, with completely different sources. It's important for the compact objects group. We study millisecond pulsars. Um, I've, in particular, studied binary systems with white dwarfs and main sequence stars. Also, how uh, black hole neutron stars can give you fast radio bursts. And these can be applied to tests of general relativity and even fuzzy dark matter. With galaxy formation, the, the links are very clear. The gravitational wave background strongly depends on the supermassive black hole masses and the galaxy-galaxy merger rates. So in fact, when we detect the gravitational wave background, we can constrain these underlying parameters. The stars in the astronomical data group, I've uh, recently done uh, a paper where we look at binary companions to millisecond pulsars, which are typically uh, white dwarfs or main sequence stars in Gaia, and W first will be a clear extension to this work when it flies. In terms of cosmology, there may be uh, an aspect of gravitational wave background polarization to look at, because the background we're looking at is astrophysical, it can be dominated by a few nearby continuous gravitational wave sources, which may be, for example, circularly polarized. Also, something I can't talk about today that please ask me about is the primordial gravitational wave background. So, not from supermassive black holes, but potentially a relic from inflation. And also, my work touches on planets. We transform all of the pulsar arrival times to the solar system very center. And to do that, we need to have an extremely good solar system ephemeris model. And so, errors on planet masses can lead to errors uh, in our data analysis. Um, but in turn, we can constrain planet masses using pulsar timing array measurements. So hopefully there's a little bit some, of something for everyone uh, in my talk. So here's my outline. I'll review the gravitational wave spectrum for you and tell you how pulsar timing arrays work. I'll then tell you about the gravitational wave background and the final parsec problem, which is an outstanding problem in astrophysics. And then where we expect to detect nearby continuous gravitational wave sources. So for anyone who's worked on LIGO, this is from supermassive black hole binary systems, uh, not from pulsars. So here the continuous gravitational waves uh, will be from supermassive black hole binary systems that are individually resolvable. I'll then bring you to the cutting edge and show you how we can improve pulsar distance measurements using uh, surveys like Gaia and how that will help you improve um, your sensitivity to continuous gravitational waves. Also how you can use galaxy surveys like TUMAS and SPSS-5 to find the host galaxies for these supermassive black hole binary systems. And finally, projecting into the future, um, I'll, I'll uh, examine departures from an isotropic gravitational wave background. We'll look at anisotropy of the background and what that can tell us about the underlying source population. Supermassive black holes. 
So to get started, I want to show you this whole gravitational wave spectrum. At the high frequency end, you have LIGO. So LIGO is currently the only gravitational wave detector to have directly detected gravitational waves. This is at the hundreds of hertz to kilohertz uh, part of the spectrum. Afterwards, we have massive binaries. So these are the baby supermassive black holes. They're 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses. Um, we shouldn't be too hard on them. We have one at the very center of our own galaxy. But in terms of gravitational wave emission, right now, what's more interesting is the pulsar timing array band here, which is in the nanohertz frequency regime. So with pulsar timing arrays, we're sensitive to both individual supermassive black hole binary systems, but also the gravitational wave background, which comes from the incoherent superposition from all of these supermassive black hole mergers over cosmic history. And so that lives right around here at the one nanohertz to hundreds of nanohertz band. Now here on the y-axis, I have the characteristic strain. And the characteristic strain uh, is exactly this uh, quantity, which is this superposition of all of the gravitational wave signals which have happened um, over cosmic merger history. Now, <clears throat> this is proportional to the change in time over time for our experiment. Now with LIGO, you're probably still thinking about the change in distance over distance of the two LIGO arms. And pulsar our timing arrays, <coughs> it's more intuitive to think of change in time over time. And the reason that we use millisecond pulsars, whoops, the reason that we use millisecond pulsars is because they are excellent clocks. So the disco H is equal to this delta T over T. So the signal that we're looking for, according to our models, is about 10 to the minus 15 in terms of strain. The total observation time that we have right now is around 10 years, which means that this delta T needs to be of the order of 100 nanoseconds in order to make a detection of gravitational waves. Only millisecond pulsars have this kind of timing precision. Regular pulsars can't do this. So millisecond pulsars are best ones, can give you tens of nanoseconds. Better ones are hundreds of nanoseconds, but most of them are microsecond level. And is the reason the sensitivity curves jump vertical at the end just the length of time that they've operated? So the, this what? here uh, yeah. is a little bit artificial from the model. It in fact goes like 1 over f squared. And it goes like 1 over f squared because of the pulsar timing model. You have to subtract a 1 over f squared term when you're doing the timing model fitting. And so that removes your sensitivity at very low. I see. I see. These are just schematics. Yeah, this is a cartoon. Uh, and in fact, this particular cartoon comes from a paper that I wrote with my dad, uh, who is Mingarelli number two. This is me. Um, which, which arose over an argument uh, over a bottle of wine at Christmas. Uh, I can tell you more about that later. We resolved it and decided to try to publish the result. So this is me. This is Mingarelli Sr. I want to emphasize that pulsar timing arrays are complementary to both LISA and LIGO. LIGO can't see pulsar timing array sources because these supermassive black holes um, merge at around 10 to the minus 6 hertz, which is right in between the two bands. Right? So for the experts in the room, this is the ISCO frequency. For a 10 to the 9 supermassive black hole binary, uh, the ISCO frequencies are on 10 to the minus 6 hertz. So they merge before ever getting into the LISA band. <clears throat> also, we, um, the LIGO sources that we're used to seeing, if we're lucky, we might see them for a few seconds in band. Uh, for pulsar timing arrays, you can see them for mega years. Right. They are at the very low uh, frequency in spiral part of their merger. Okay. So the sensitivity curve for LISA, is that also um, like just a sketch? Or is that this slope is, at low frequency representative? This is also, uh, this is more representative, yes. Here there's missing like a little wiggle that goes so, up here. But. So if you extend that slope downwards, it looks like it will cross the uh, pulsar timing array sensitivity at around 10 to the minus uh, 7. How long do you want to make the least arms? I think that they're already stretched as long as they should be. Right, that means the actual curve has a cutoff then. This one, it's, this absolutely has a cutoff, yeah, right, which so is set by the length of the arms. Sure, I mean, I guess we could write and then say, yeah, this should go up exactly. Okay. Sure. Can I just understand? So you're saying. 
Yeah. yeah, so what I'm saying is that very specifically for a 10 to the 9 solar mass binary at 1 nanohertz, it's time to coalesce into 25 megahertz. Now, if that same binary were at 10 to the minus 7 hertz at the very edge of the sensitivity band, it's still about 150 years from merging. So people have talked about seeing events in LISA yeah. evolve into the LIGO band. Yes, that's right. right. So there's the Susanna paper which shows that you would have seen the first uh, black hole detection essentially in the LISA band evolving here. What right. I'm trying to, sorry, go on. So yeah, so, but this could happen with, uh, uh, you know, PTA, but it will take. What I'm saying is that it can't, what I'm saying is that it can't more happen. Patients. I'm saying it can't happen with PTAs in the same way because the source, if you were to detect it in the PTA band, these typical binaries merge at 10 to the minus six hertz. That's their physical frequency. And that's, that's outside of the LISA band. So they never make it from PTAs into LISA in that direct same way that uh, a compact object in LISA can make it to LIGO. So even if it were detected right before leaving the band, it merges before it ever gets into the LISA band. And that still takes about 150 years. So <clears throat> the supermassive black holes that we're looking for are in the centers of massive galaxies. And when galaxies merge, the central supermassive black holes should merge. When they're emitting gravitational waves, as we can see here, they are separated by a milliparsec. So they've overcome the final parsec problem, which I'll tell you more about later, and they start emitting gravitational waves. We see these gravitational waves from this slow in-spiral regime. So here, the gravitational wave signal is largely sinusoidal. And again, these are supermassive black holes with masses of 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 solar. Now the gravitational waves are of course emitted in all directions and they stretch and squash the fabric of space-time as they propagate. At the Earth, we time these excellent millisecond pulsars. And what happens is that as the gravitational wave transits the galaxy, the distance between the Earth and the pulsar uh, is stretched and squashed. So you can see here that the signal gets red-shifted or blue-shifted, where equivalently the pulsar pulses arrive a little bit early or a little bit late. And this is how a pulsar timing array works in that shell. Now, if you were to see that kind of uh, pulsar pulse arriving early or late in just one pulsar, that could be anything, right? We are not claiming that we understand pulsars so well that even that kind of little uh, small glitch over 10 years is noticeable. That's why we use a whole array of millisecond pulsars. So right now, we have 65 millisecond pulsars that are monitored by the International Pulsar Timing Array. And the gravitational wave signal, importantly, is in all of the pulsars. The noise in the pulsars is not correlated. So the more pulsars that you have, the more signal that you have, and the more the noise is debated. So pulsars themselves, I'll just uh, spend a moment talking about them, are compact objects. So there's clear links to studying pulsars with the compact objects group. They're rotating neutron stars, they have high magnetic fields, they're the remnants of supernova explosion. They were discovered about 50 years ago by Jocelyn Bell, seen here with her number one fan. <laughs> and um, she didn't know what a selfie was. I was the first person to tell her what a selfie was when they asked permission. To take <laughs> <laughs> and we check whether she retained that? Like, if we call her now? <laughs> she probably didn't even retain me, so chances <laughs> are, are probably not. Probably not. Um, so these pulsars are, are timed by not only radio telescopes in North America, but all over the world. And in fact, pulsar timing is a key project in radio astronomy globally. And yet in the International Pulsar Timing Array, we have eight telescopes, and we're trying to expand our reach to India, which is now trying to become a part of the International Pulsar Timing Array, and also the Deep Space Network. So the Deep Space Network is a NASA set of telescopes that communicate with satellites that are not in low Earth orbit. So when you get uh, signals from Juno, for example, this comes through the Deep Space Network, Curiosity through the Deep Space Network. The great thing about these telescopes is that they're roughly the same size as Parkes, which is in Australia, um, but they have a lot of dead time on them. And by a lot, I mean around 15 minutes. And so if your telescope is pointing at the right part of the sky and you have 15 minutes to time a pulsar, 
this is an eternity for a millisecond pulsar. This will give you a really high signal to noise ratio for your measurement, and you can add data this way. Right now, in the US, there's the Green Bank Telescope in Virginia, and also Arecibo in Puerto Rico, uh, which we use in the nanograv collaboration to time our millisecond pulsar. Fast in China is uh, very rapidly trying to catch up and become part of the International Pulsar Timing Array. And Meerkat in South Africa, which is a square kilometer array pathfinder, has already timed a millisecond pulsar down to five nanoseconds. So this seems like it's very promising for the future of pulsar timing arrays. So do you need collecting area or telescopes? Both. Uh, so this is something that we're thinking about strategically right now in terms of nanograph. So the question that we're trying to answer is should we have many, many, many dishes that we can have all of the time that are relatively small and cheap, or should we invest in a mega telescope? And the answer is uh, is not 100% clear either way. It's clear. Is there a bunch of 30 meter communication telescopes, communication radio dishes still scattered around the whole world? Yes. So they're underutilized. So Whaley has one of these in uh, Algonquin Park, mm -hmm. and he uses it to, to time pulsar. So, um, it's something that's, uh, that, that is difficult to really quantify, but it's something that we're working on right now. You know, is there a bunch in Africa, Korea, there's just a bunch, we looked into them for communication, and there's a lot of unutilized ones. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so there's a whole strategic uh, planning working group in Nanogram that's looking into this question right now. So I talked about this actual minus observed arrival time as the jumping off point for looking for gravitational waves. And here's an example of a residual, which is this uh, expected minus actual arrival time for pulsar 1713 plus 0747. Um, for people who are not radio astronomers, this is the right ascension and declination of the pulsar. And so you can see here, the residuals are all very close to zero and they're white, which is very good. Um, if there were red noise in the pulsar, this would look very similar to a potential gravitational wave signal and make the pulsar not very useful for gravitational wave detection. So this, um, by saying typical, I mean, of course, it's one of our best pulsars. <laughs> uh, so here, this is the residuals from pulsar A and pulsar B. Um, to extract the gravitational wave signal, there's two pieces that I'm gonna talk to you about. One here is this correlation function, and this is the gravitational wave signal that correlates all of the residuals in your pulsars. And the other piece here is the characteristic strain. And this, uh, in turn, contains the astrophysics of the sources themselves. In terms of uh, our galaxy right now, there's around 2,300 known pulsars. And around 10% of them are millisecond pulsars, which we time with nanograv. There could be 30,000 more detectable such millisecond pulsars. And of course, studying these uh, has clear links to the CCA in terms of compact objects and stars. So I'm not sure if everyone can see this bottom part of the screen, but I'll be flashing, you can also see it here, um, but I'll be flashing up which groups uh, each slide is related to on the bottom of the screen, just so that you can look for your name. Uh, but yeah. but presume, I mean, you said there's 65 being monitored. Why aren't you monitoring all of them? <coughs> so some of them have, some of them are just not good enough timers. Meaning they're like glitchy. Well, only one millisecond pulsar is known to glitch. It's called 0613, and it glitches around once every eight years. The other ones have red noise that just builds up over time. And so even if you start timing it for five or six years, sometimes you just have to I see. stop it. I see. So it's not obvious, and, and presuming it as you go fainter, so it's not obvious that there's far more uh, sources, like high quality sources than these 65. There, what do you think there is? Because so it's I've asked, relevant. I've talked to Maura McLaughlin, McLaughlin and Duncan Lorimer about this, who are uh, expert pulsar astronomers. And right now, the way that these pulsars have been discovered are through surveys that are mostly focused around the galactic plane. Uh, millisecond pulsars, because they're a bit older, have had time to migrate outside of the plane. And so we could actually be missing some very good millisecond pulsars because we haven't been looking there. Okay, good. Yeah. And one more question, which is the, the there, do appear to be some timing points that are many sigma off, yeah. and I live in the real world, and I can imagine getting rid of that. But is it understood why there are large outliers? Because that is potentially relevant to the long term. 
Outlier rejection is something that um, the timing model uh, working group is working very hard on. Good. Yeah. From a, that's the stats answer, but I was actually asking a physics question. Yeah. Um, it's not always clear why that happens. And in fact, once there was a back end upgrade here, just in 2012, in the telescopes, you can see that there are fewer outliers, so but there be, are still some. It could be instrumental. It might not be the pulsar. Or it might not be the. Probably not the pulsar. It's probably not the pulsar. Saying. Because it looks really good at the, after the upgrade. Exactly. Yeah. How about the red noise in millisecond pulsars? Is yeah. that understood? So the red noise uh, could be could come from uh, poorly modeled spin down rates, spin parameters of the pulsar. There's a lot of things that we still don't understand about pulsars that are very actively being researched. I mean, the emission mechanism isn't even completely understood at this point. So you understand as much as you can about the pulsar and you model it in your timing model. Things like binary companions factor in, a few of them, well, just one of them is in a triple system even. Um, all of these things are uh, affect the pulsar time arrivals and so uh, are very well modeled by the current software that we use. So this whiteness we see here is after all already subtracting uh, an involved model? Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. after it's been So to come back to one of your questions, uh, David, what I think is the, the way forward to find some more millisecond pulsars and a more targeted way is to use Fermi. So Fermi uh, can look at the, of course, the gamma ray emission uh, across the sky, but some of these are in fact millisecond pulsars. So just because they have a weak gamma emission doesn't mean that they have a weak radio emission. So by following up Fermi sources, you can in fact strategically add millisecond pulsars to some parts of the sky. And that way you get rid of uh, the politics and the uncertainty that comes from surveying the galactic plane. So currently there's 86 millisecond pulsars that have been found this way and they're uh, highlighted here in their respective colors, which tells you which telescope that they were timed at. Um, can I have a question about that? Yeah. You, so I thought Fermi had a problem of telling millisecond pulsars like in the galactic plane, they had a problem with determining whether it was a millisecond pulsar. Are you saying outside of the plane? Because I thought like the dust obscured things and so they couldn't differentiate. Well, it was more, yeah. what I'm going to talk about in a few slides, and you're, yes, um, is the fact that um, we, we follow up some Fermi sources with radio observations to see if they're millisecond pulsars, and not all of them are. In fact, it's only about 22% of them that are. So we have to follow up a large number of sources if you want to get a few. <clears throat> um, so this relationship between the residuals and the correlation function, which has to do with the uh, signature of the gravitational waves in the pulsar, and then this characteristic strain, which tells you about the astrophysics in the background, will follow us throughout the next few slides so that you can understand what part um, of this function we're studying. So this is the Hellings and Downs curve. And for a gravitational wave background, this is the equivalent of our waveform. This is the signal that we're looking for in the data. For an isotropic background, this gamma AB here is called the overlap reduction function, which is just the correlation function. So for pulsar A and pulsar B, if they're separated by about 30 degrees on the sky, your correlation function value will be about 0.22. So that's what goes into here when you're looking gravitational wave background. If they're separated by 160 degrees, you get a value of around 0.2, and so on and so forth. So if you have a very dense pulsar timing array, you can very well sample this curve, which means that as you cross-correlate all of your millisecond pulsars, this Hellings and Downs curve should be the figure which you plot, which is the smoking gun for the gravitational wave background. As you cross-correlate the pulsars, this is denser and denser, um, eventually, at the beginning, you'll have pretty large error bars here, but you can still pick out the Hellings and Downs curve. Now, what's interesting about the Hellings and Downs curve is that this was published in 1983. And in fact, um, it wasn't even an analytical uh, formula that they gave, well, not purely analytical, they, they put it through Maxima, which was the precursor to Mathematica. Glennis is, is smiling knowingly. Uh, and in fact, their, their student did it. And so when they wrote down the analytical expression for the overlap reduction function, it didn't have a lot of physical intuition built into it because it wasn't solved by hand. 
Um, and so in 2013, I said, well, what if the background isn't isotropic? If it really is built up of all of these individual sources, then surely there might be hot spots in the sky. If there's a galaxy cluster, I would expect more gravitational wave signal in that part of the sky. And so I was the first person to look at a dipole, a quadrupole, an octopole. After the octopole, my supervisor said, that's enough. <laughs> you don't have to do this anymore. Um, but the important thing is that you can see here that these are all very different, right? These are these, these spaghetti-like curves. Uh, each spaghetto is very different from the other. Similarly, if you have an alternative theory of gravity that has a different polarization, such as a breathing mode, you again get a different correlation function. Right, so all of these gamma ABs are modified by your theory of gravity, by these polarizations, or by the assumption that your background is isotropic. So uh, you can put a little P of omega hat here as well. So in principle, you're saying you could learn the whole anisotropy and polarization of the background with this set of pulsars. Absolutely, Sweet. yeah. So the other part that I'll now tell you about is the characteristic strain. So we, we set, we just finished exploring this overlap reduction function or this correlation function, which tells you more about fundamental physics. The characteristic strain tells you about the astrophysics of your sources. So the characteristic strain squared scales like the frequency to the minus four thirds. What's built into this signal that we expect is the galaxy galaxy <coughs> merger rate or the number of merger remnants per commuting volume, and the chirp mass of the binaries to the power of 5 thirds. And this is integrated over all redshift and all chirp masses. So when we detect the actual gravitational wave background, what we'll be able to tell is uh, potentially, or constrain, what the galaxy-galaxy merger rate is, and also what the average supermassive black hole chirp mass is. So now that you've seen the easy version of this, I just didn't want to scare you at first. Um, this is actually the way that uh, our formula scales. There's a very weak dependence on the redshift and um, a much stronger dependence on the supermassive black hole chirp mass. Now, this looks like a mess, right? And what's uh, the good news is that all of this double integral is the amplitude of the background. This is all A. When you take the square root of the characteristic strain squared, you get this uh, frequency to the minus two-thirds scaling if it's a supermassive black hole background. Um, Sterl Finney explored this in 2001, and Alvaro Cezanne again in 2013. Uh, if you have a primordial background, this index changes, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about that later. Um, we report this uh, characteristic strain at a reference frequency of one over a year. And so the cosmologists in the room might be more interested in the gravitational wave energy density, this scales as the characteristic strain squared. So we know a lot about the amplitude of the background now. In fact, in the recent years, there's been a surge in upper limits on the gravitational wave background. And so we seem to be converging to around one times 10 to the minus 15 for the amplitude of the background. And that's where a lot of the models tell us that the gravitational wave signal should live for the gravitational wave background. So we believe that we're getting close, but what we, can, what we can do when we're starting to get this close is to start to rule out models. For example, models that tell us that black hole masses are very massive. Because of the strong dependence of the characteristic strain on the black hole mass, if your masses are too large, your signal gets too big, so you can start to constrain these underlying scaling relations uh, and look at the final parsec problem. So the final parsec problem um, goes as follows. You have your two galaxies merging, and in the center you have supermassive black holes. These sink to the center of your newly formed galaxy through a process called dynamical friction, which is a kind of gravitational breaking. Now, the black holes can get to within about a parsec of each other, seven or eight parsecs, maybe 10 parsecs, but order of a parsec. And they start to interact with stars. Stars cross the orbit of the binary. But you can run out of stars. And if you run out of stars, the black holes can't get to the milliparsec scale they need to be at in order to emit gravitational waves and merge. So the stars, um, this process of stars crossing the orbit of the binary is called stellar hardening. You can also have gas that's torquing your binary, which carries away energy and angular momentum, 
and makes your binary shrink. The important thing is that you need to get it to within a centiparsec or a milliparsec for gravitational waves to efficiently make your supermassive black hole binary merge within a Hubble time. How about like uh, clouds of uh, black holes in the medium mass black holes, for example? I yes. guess the typical radius that we have, the distance from the center they would have would be like the inverse of their mass or something? Or uh... So um, I'm going to get to exactly that in a few slides. So uh, Rosalba Perna and Jared Ostreicher had a student, Kehu Ryu, who looked at this. And, uh, and that's a really interesting one. So the important part is to get the supermassive black holes to within about a milliparsec, either through stellar hardening, uh, through gas interactions, in order to make it merge. So once you can get them to within about um, a milliparsec, then they spend around 10 to the 7 years in this early in spiral. Right? After that, when they're in around the Lisa band, right before merger, they can spend a few months here and then eventually merge and you see a, a burst of gravitational radiation. So with pulsar timing arrays, we're really focused on this particular part of the gravitational wave signal. Um, but eventually with Lisa, I'll be looking at this part of the signal as well. So the way that we can access this underlying astrophysics of how supermassive black holes merge, which is really the bread and butter of my work, you can look at how these uh, different interactions affect the shape of the strain spectrum. So this is the characteristic strain, and this is the frequency of the background. Now, if we just have this strict f to the minus 2 thirds power law, you have a black line here. This is if your binaries are circular, and you are in this vanilla model of a universe where everything is working perfectly. The uh, thick green band here tells you that the amplitude of the background can be uncertain, that this uncertainty only affects the amplitude of the background, but not the uh, frequency evolution or the shape of the spectrum. So the galaxy population uncertainties are things like the merger time scales. Are things really, do they work the way that we think they do? Do you have a dynamical friction time scale, a stellar hardening time scale, a gravitational wave time scale. Have we modeled these things correctly? Do we understand that physics? What about the black hole host relations? We've got lots of different models for black hole masses. We've got Cormandy and Ho, McConnell and Ma, Herring and Ricks. They all give different answers for black hole masses. The pair fraction um, of these supermassive black holes. How often do we expect to find one of these pairs? And how do all of these things evolve with redshift, right? All of these things go into the amplitude of the spectrum. What's really interesting is the shape of the spectrum and how it can turn over at these very low frequencies. Now this happens because when you're at very low frequencies or equivalently very wide binary separation, it's much more efficient for your supermassive black holes to shrink their semi-major axis by interacting with stars, gas, or if your binary is eccentric and you emit gravitational waves and all of these higher harmonics and it makes it merge more quickly. So what happens here is that you lose power in the gravitational wave part of the evolution because you're evolving by stellar hardening or gas. And that makes this part of the spectrum turn over. Your signal here is depleted. So this shape of the spectrum can in turn tell you when it's measured what the dominant mechanism for solving the final parsec problem is. So the gas interactions, that turnover happens at around 0.3 nanohertz. For stars, that happens at a few nanohertz. And so it's potentially possible when we can measure the shape of the spectrum to in turn understand what solves the final parsec problem, what the dominant mechanism is. Now, Sigrid's point, uh, I'll get to now, about stalling, um, well, maybe you weren't going there, but it has to do with the answer. Well, what if your supermassive black holes actually do stall? Right? What if there's no justice in the universe? And LIGO can see lots of black holes merging and we can't see any, right? <clears throat> well, what you need to remember is something that both Sehu Ryu and Matteo Bonetti point out, and that's that we live in a dynamical universe. You'll eventually have a third galaxy which merges with the galaxy that hosts your stalled binary. And this third black hole will interact with your stalled binary. The least massive black hole will be ejected, and the remaining two black holes will merge within a Hubble time. Now that happens in the case of a major merger. In the case of minor mergers, there are many, many minor mergers that get into Sigrid's scenario, where you have this kind of globular cluster type shape happening in the center of your 
galaxy. If there's enough mass, um, which is roughly the mass of one of the black holes, then you can solve the final parsec problem this way. That will deplete your signal by about 30%, but you'll still eventually detect the gravitational wave background. Uh, so here we have a figure of all of the different astrophysical models as a function of when we expect to detect them. Uh, and I want to thank Dan Foreman Mackey for giving me comments on this uh, quick paper that I wrote for Nature Astronomy that just appeared. So <clears throat> here we have a somewhat infamous model of the gravitational wave background. And this is a really strong predicted signal. This is McWilliams, Ostriker, and Pretorius 2014. This model is called very strong because it takes all of the underlying components of the background and it turns all of the knobs to 11. What if you have very massive black holes? What if you have a very fast galaxy-galaxy merger rate? Basically the maximum that you can have with current observation. Um, <clears throat> and what if nothing stalls and all of your binaries are circular and life is great, right? <laughs> then, we, then we should uh, detect this background at a three sigma level uh, in 2021. Now, because we haven't uh, seen a signal yet, we already know that this can't, that's because pulsar timing arrays are like CMB experiments. The signal integrates in time. So before seeing a three sigma detection, we will see a two sigma feature and get very excited about it and then start predicting what the time to detection will be and how the detection confidence evolves in time. We already have a handle on all of these things. And so I just want to be very clear here, this is a 95% detection probability of a three sigma signal. That's what all of these numbers mean. Now, if we say, well, this, well, we already know that this can't be. So let, let's move to the next one. What if we have a gravitational wave background where we sample from some eccentricity distribution, the black hole masses we sample from different black hole host scaling relations. We use everything that's very moderate, very average, not quite conservative, but much more conservative than this model here. We should be able to detect that in 2022. Uh, Stalled gravitational wave background. Now this is what I was just explaining. This is Tehu Ryu's paper. Um, again, Jerry uh, was on both of these papers. And so this is if we have the stalled black holes that eventually merge through interacting with many other supermassive black holes. Um, this background is only a little bit weaker than the modern gravitational wave background. And now we get into the two kind of nightmare scenarios, which aren't really that bad of a nightmare. Uh, one is, what if the black hole masses have all been overestimated? Francesco Schenkar wrote a paper on this in 2016, uh, which is a little bit controversial, but the claim is, is that all black hole masses have been overestimated. So if we create a gravitational wave background using this new black hole host relation, we get uh, the amplitude being a little bit lower than otherwise expected. Now, what if we have the opposite of a McWilliams, Ostrich, or Pretorius model? What if we take all the knobs and turn them all the way down? What if we have black holes that are the least massive possible? What if they merge only through many body interactions after having stalled? What if, you know, the worst case scenario? This is a floor of the gravitational wave background. That's a 10 to the minus 16 in terms of amplitude. And we should get there by 2029. So this is the absolute worst case scenario. Um, and the good news is, is that we still detect that five years before Lisa fly. And also, this would be a revolution. That supermassive black holes all stall, that they only merge through these many body interactions. And if we get beyond this, without having detected a gravitational wave background signal, then you start to get into really weird kinds of physics. Um, that would also be very exciting. Bigger. Are there any older stars off the top of the graph to the left there? What there. people thought they Yes. <laughs> there was a model, uh, 1996, um, uh, I'm going to butcher the author's last name, but it's uh, Rajopani. Anyhow, it's the 1996-1997 paper, and they predicted that the amplitude of the background was 10 to the minus 14. So it almost seems a little bit rude to put that up here because that was a very early paper back when everyone was still trying to figure stuff out. So Right, but the point was that uh, when people thought it might have been possible to detect something by now. Right? Yes, but they also had different uh, expectations of supermassive black hole masses. They didn't have all the information that we have. Yeah. So 
um, to come back to your excellent question on Fermi. One, one of the things that I'm really interested in doing is to optimize the International Pulsar Timing Array to make a gravitational wave background detection. So if you plot all of the current millisecond pulsars that are being timed by the IPTA, uh, and you look at the sensitivity on the sky to gravitational waves, you can see that there's this cold spot on the sky over here where we don't have any millisecond pulsar. So what I did was to just Monte Carlo over the sky by adding pulsars to see what the best place to add more pulsars is. And so we found at this location here, if we added five millisecond pulsars, we'll double our sensitivity in this uh, cold spot on the sky. And so my colleagues and I got together and wrote some telescope proposals. And we were awarded 53 hours of telescope time on Arecibo and GBT. And we um, followed up 34 Fermi lab sources. So if the current statistics hold true, that around 22% of these sources are millisecond pulsars, then we should have around seven, which we can add to the IPTA to increase our sensitivity to the gravitational wave background. So this is a way of fast forwarding our time to detection. It's not taken into account uh, in the previous slide that I showed you in those activities. So what you've learned so far, just to remind you, in case you had something else to do in the last few minutes, uh, is that pulsars are excellent clocks. <coughs> And we need really good clocks to look for gravitational waves. The gravitational wave background itself contains, is, is really rich in astrophysics. You have information on the supermassive black hole mergers, supermassive black hole masses, and the amplitude and the shape of the background are both really interesting. The detection of the gravitational wave background in turn depends on this underlying astrophysics and if supermassive black holes merge directly or through many body interactions, which happen afterwards. This makes the next few years really exciting as we start to really plow deeply into this parameter space of expected amplitudes of the background. We can start ruling out uh, more and more models. <clears throat> so we're now going to switch gears and talk about individual supermassive black hole binary systems. So before we were talking about the background, which is this incoherent superposition of gravitational waves from all of the supermassive black hole mergers, <coughs> and now I really want to know which galaxies nearby are going to host the individual supermassive black hole binary system. And how can we try to get a handle on this? So this is a, a question that I uh, tried to assemble a dream team to answer, because it's complicated. So Joe Lazio at the time was uh, my contact at JPL, and I worked with Alberta Susanna uh, and Jenny Green, who found all of the galaxies. Justin Ellis and Chung Pei Ma. Chung Pei Ma of course, um, is the, the Ma of McConnell and Ma, and of also very many famous cosmology papers. Um, <clears throat> as Steve Croft works on SETI and is an expert radio astronomer, as is Sarah Brooks Bellor, and Steve Taylor is one of my nanograph colleagues and one of my co chairs for the IPTA Gravitational Wave Working Group. And so my idea here was to look at a galaxy survey, right? We are not going to be surprised by the location of a supermassive black hole binary system. It's going to be in a massive galaxy. With LIGO, you don't know where your sources are going to be on the sky. For us, we just look at massive galaxies, and you know that this is where your supermassive black hole binaries will be. So why not use this information? Previously, we just had simulations. And for example, Alberta Susanna would take something like the Millennium simulation and see like if you followed all of these merger trees, what the um, time to detection of individual sources would be. So my approach is to not use simulations and then uh, look for time to detection. My approach is to look at the actual sky that we have, to use uh, whole sky surveys like two mass to try to compute the probability of each galaxy hosting a supermassive black hole binary system. So to do that, I estimated the black hole masses using MM bulge uh, from McConnell in my 2013. But importantly, if this galaxy has a very well-measured black hole mass, I use that instead, because let's use all of the information that we have at hand. I use the galaxy-galaxy merger rates from Illustris. And this, of course, can be easily modified to include something from example, Vigal et al. 2017, an observationally based galaxy-galaxy merger rate. This is um, a very easily modifiable part of my code, which is public and I can have. So what I found by mixing all of these um, <clears throat> quantities together over 75,000 
realizations of the local universe is that there are around 91 plus or minus seven nearby galaxies that are hosting supermassive black hole binaries emitting nanohertz gravitational waves. Now, it doesn't mean that they are detectable. It means that they exist in nature. This is a map of what nature could look like. Uh, the detection depends on our pulsar timing array. That's our instrument. So the background may be, or the, the nearby sources could be quite numerous. And also interestingly, there were seven plus or minus two stalled binary systems. Now, I think that the stalling came from the fact that I looked at the scatter in the black hole host relation. And so sometimes the black hole mass was very large compared to the number of stars or the stellar mass of the galaxy. Uh, and therefore you couldn't make the black hole merge by ejecting all of the stars that existed in some uh, very fringe cases. So having 91 plus or minus seven sources really begs the question, should we have detected something already? And also, what is the time to detection of these sources? So here I have a map of the 5,119 galaxies that I got out of two maps, uh, which were massive uh, elliptical and SO galaxies, and convolved it with this uh, European pulsar timing array sensitivity map to individual continuous gravitational wave sources. These orange stars are the best pulsars that we have. And the white stars are the other pulsars. And so you can see that behind these orange pulsars, we have this orange uh, yellow map. Now, this is where we are more sensitive to gravitational waves. In fact, we're four times more sensitive in this part of the sky here than we are over here because we have these excellent pulsars. And the dream scenario for a continuous gravitational wave source is to have it aligned with a very good pulsar. That's where you get your maximum response to gravitational waves. Stephanie? Um, just so I'm sure, best pulsar means smallest? Best uh, pulsar in this case means a very small residual uh, and very high cadence observation. Thank you for, for asking that. So over my Monte Carlo realizations, what I found uh, is unsurprising in the sense that the sources that I detected using our current maps, uh, we're all in this best sky location, pretty much, uh, almost exclusively over here. Now the size of these balls corresponds to the size of the strain. So sometimes when you have very loud sources, you can detect them anyway. But most of the uh, other sources that were detected, the smaller balls, were in the part of the sky with more sensitivity. So the pulsar location really matters. What's also important is that there were only 130 universes <clears throat> which contained a resolvable supermassive black hole binary system over 75,000, which means that the fact that we haven't detected anything yet is very good. Yeah. <laughs> Five minutes? Yeah. Um, so there's a quick update on this sky map. I, I just did the astrophysical analysis for the latest nanograv 11 year data, and now uh, there was a 1% chance of detecting a supermassive black hole binary. Uh, so our current non-detection is still unsurprising, um, but we still have the similar features that we have in the EPTA data, and that's that our best pulsars really uh, give us more sensitivity in one part of the sky than the other. So the time to detection of these individual sources really depends on how white uh, your pulsar residuals are. So if you have an array uh, where you have mostly white noise uh, compared to one with strong red noise, you can really see the difference in the time to detection. So this case here isn't really worth thinking about right now because we don't have an entirely red noise dominated pulsar timing array. These are just the two extremes uh, to compare and contrast. With white noise in our signals, we expect to make a three sigma detection um, absolutely in the next 10 years. So over the 70, this is a single realization of the gravitational wave background here. And I want to be clear that this 15 year curve is a total observation time of 15 years and not 15 years from now. So right now we are basically at 15 years. This is for 20 years and 25 years. That's for the current array size. So this is uh, expanding by adding four pulsars every year with 300 nanosecond residuals. This is for the international pulsar time. Right now, Nanograv does this on its own. And so this is a very conservative estimate. 
Um, I also want to point out that we can have more than one detection. This table here um, tells you what the false alarm probability is, or uh, in term, uh, if you prefer two sigma, three sigma, four sigma detection, um, the chance of us having detected something right now uh, at a two sigma level is very low. In five years from now, we should definitely be detecting something um, at a two sigma level, and in 10 years from now, we'll absolutely detect something at a 10 sigma level. Uh, sorry, two sigma level. Um, but also, in 10 years from now, we should have a four sigma detection or a detection with a false alarm probability of around 10 to the minus four. So, <clears throat> what's really great about this kind of work is that I use a real galaxy survey with real sources. And so then you can rank each galaxy by its probability of hosting a supermassive black hole binary system as another way of trying to follow up um, these sources. We can also um, look at extending the scatter in the black hole host relation that we use to see if that gives you an exaggerated time to detection or not. And in fact, this is um, a question that I that I um, followed up on with Morgan Nanez, who was one of the CCA interns. And it turns out that you can get nonsense errors if you increase the scatter in your black hole host relation too much, um, which is great because it means that if you, for example, expect to see 12 sources today, you know that you haven't seen them, you can constrain the scatter in your black hole galaxy scaling relation. Can I ask a question yes. about the, am I understanding the clause that in 10 years you'll see either one to five sources of three sigma? Am I understanding that correctly? Um, in 10 years, this is a particular uh, realization. Um, in 10 years, we'll have at least one. So this is saying uh, now this is our chance of, of detecting something five years from now and then 10 years from now at these different false alarm probabilities. So that's the best case scenario, so 10 years you'll see five. You, you could, this is one of the particular realizations, okay. but it's not typical, so that's why I just give the statistical uh, interpretation down here. So sure, if we're very, very lucky, we could. <clears throat> the number one galaxy uh, that I found to host supermassive black hole binary systems was Sombrero, which is a very strange answer. One might naively expect M87 or a very massive nearby galaxy to host uh, these binary systems. Um, but that's not the case. And I'll tell you why I believe this result in a second. What I want to highlight here is the fact that I can sort all of these galaxies in two mass by the probability of hosting a supermassive black hole binary, which is useful for programs like the Event Horizon Telescope, who after imaging M87 don't really know what else to look at. So we can give them a rent list. And you're plotting the probability that this one dominates in your set of universes? This is the amount of times that this galaxy hosted a detectable supermassive black hole binary system over 25 years. In your, in your set of yeah. fake universes. That's true. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so the reason that I think uh, that this is indeed the case is that the probability of a galaxy hosting a supermassive black hole binary system is proportional to the time to coalescence Binary, right? This is in turn proportional to the chirp mass to the minus five thirds of your binary system. And so if you look here, what you can see is the distribution of chirp masses um, as a function of probability. And so this is for a 25 year data set, and the orange is white noise and the uh, blue is red noise. And so <clears throat> what I found is that there's a sweet spot in terms of the mass of the binary where your binary is massive enough to be detectable, but not so massive that it zooms through the pulsar timing array band and you don't get the chance to detect it because it merges too quickly. Also, your binary, if it's not massive enough, will never be detectable. So what's important uh, for future work, which involves uh, both the CCA and University of Connecticut, is the Black Hole Mapper Project in SCSS5. So there'll be potentially 400,000 light curves to follow up, which could be these individual supermassive black hole binary systems. And using this kind of technique, I can rank them uh, for their probability of hosting supermassive black hole binary systems. Uh, indeed, right now, what I'm doing today and in the next few weeks is computing this probability for all periodic light curves, which have been recently published, so that I can publish a catalog of these periodic light curves and rank them by their probability of hosting a supermassive black hole binary system. <clears throat> What's difficult in the aspect of multi-messenger astrophysics here 
is that we don't really know if there is an electromagnetic counterpart to the actual merger itself. When these supermassive black holes are decoupled from their environment and emitting gravitational waves, there shouldn't be any gas or stars interacting with them. However, uh, Andrew McFadgen uh, and his student Yankee Tang and also Zoltan Heyman found in some simulations that you get a trickle of gas onto the system, which could in turn uh, launch some jets and make these systems more detectable. But it's not clear that this happens all the time. So what we can, what we can constrain with an individual supermassive black hole binary detection um, are things like the post-Newtonian expansion. If you want to constrain the spin of your supermassive black hole binary system, you can do this uh, by using pulsar timing arrays. So if you have your binary system here, which is 10 to the 9 solar mass, and it's emitting gravitational waves. When you detect the signal at the Earth, here, the signal from the pulsars will be arriving from a kiloparsec away, two kiloparsecs away, and so on, which means that the pulsar signal is about 3,000 light years old. Now, if you detect this and you're, you've been timing it for 10 years, what you see is the signal from the past. So this is the kind of <coughs> gravity echo. For those of you who have heard of light echoes, this is an equivalent gravity echo, uh, which is actually David's way of, of describing it that I really like. Uh, so each one of these pulsar turns gives you a gravity echo. And if you know the pulsar distances, you can concatenate all of these snapshots and reconstruct your waveform over the last few thousand years. Now, if you don't take into account the spins of your supermassive black hole, you can't do this phase matching correctly. Because if you have something like spin orbit coupling, if you look at the 1.5 post-Newtonian term, for example, then you have 45.8 uh, fewer wave cycles. Your binary is evolving more quickly if you have this spin orbit coupling happening. Uh, this goes all the way to spin-spin terms. But in order to do this, you need to have precise pulsar distance measurement. In fact, anything that affects the gravitational wave phase can be constrained using this kind of technique. And that um, is not only spin, but things like dark matter, dipolar radiation, and even things like super radiance, where your uh, black holes are being spun down by uh, emitting these dark matter particles. Anything that affects the phase can do this. A straightforward uh, link, maybe one of the only links you can make between pulsar timing and LISA, which are, um, again, at very uh, high frequencies, as in 10 to the minus 4 for me is an unbelievably high frequency, uh, hertz, is a similar idea. Here you have your LISA signal at the Earth. You have your pulsar signals arriving from the past. Um, but here, the link is that you don't see it directly with, with the whole array. You see it in, in one pulsar. So if your signal is 10 to the minus 4 hertz at the Earth, at the pulsars, it can be something like 7 times 10 to the minus 7 hertz. Right? And that's in the pulsar timing array there. So that's one of the ways of linking LISA and pulsar timing is, again, doing the same kind of waveform reconstruction from a few thousand years ago. But now you access not only the in spiral, but also the merger with LISA. Now, if you want to do this, you have to think on long time scales. LISA will fly in around 2034. And in order to do this kind of phase matching, you need 30 years of good quality pulsar observations. And so that's one of the things with pulsar timing arrays is you have to start thinking about the future right now so that you don't end up 10 years from now wishing that you'd done something in the past. So in order to get these very good pulsar distance measurements, I was thinking, well, how can I use Gaia? I invaded one of uh, David Hogg's meetings and I was like, guys, I need to have good pulsar distance measurement. How can I use Gaia? And so then David asked me, well, is there an optical counterpart to your pulsar? And I was like, well, not necessarily from the pulsar itself, but they have white dwarf companions a lot of the time, or main sequence companions. This is probably a leading question. And so um, what I did with the help of Lauren Anderson and Megan Bedell was to cross-correlate the International Pulsar Timing Array pulsars with the Gaia database. Uh, and I found six, uh, so I found five existing millisecond pulsars and a new uh, optical counterpart that had been previously undetected um, for this pulsar system here, 1843 minus 1113. So by normalizing these distances and multiplying them together, we now have improved distance measurements for our millisecond pulsars. If you're interested in what these dispersion measure models tell us about the distances of the pulsars, I can tell you 
a little bit about that later. There's also direct applications to this. Matt Pitkin from LIGO emailed me to say that he's using our new distances right now in a new LIGO paper. Um, we can get new limits on uh, tests of general relativity with this particular pulsar. Um, this pulsar system here is supposed to be in a two to 20,000 year uh, orbital period. Uh, we don't find that at all, so that's interesting. These are all also um, detected with very high confidence. And Milky Way Mapper and W first will uh, also help to improve these estimates. One of the things that I'm interested in looking on uh, in the future with Gaia is to measure the uh, galactic potential of the galaxy. With pulsar timing, um, I can measure the binary orbital period derivative. With Gaia, I can measure the proper motions in the distance. And from these two quantities, I can measure what the galactic potential is. And this has really interesting um, implications for dark matter models as well in the galaxy. So to wrap it up, um, I'm going to just say that building up the gravitational wave background and looking at its anisotropy is really interesting. I have one of these uh, realizations from the 75,000 I did. And when you turn this particular realization into a background, you can see it's dominated by the single source right here. Um, if you don't have this kind of uh, you know, <clears throat> outlier universe where you have a loud source, if you have a more typical universe that doesn't have it, you can see this kind of uh, CMB-like map of the gravitational wave background. This would be the picture of the anisotropy in the background. You can look at the angular power spectrum of this background, decomposing it on the basis of spherical harmonics, like I did in my 2013 and 2014 papers, and see that if you plot the CL normalized to the isotropic component C0, the level of anisotropy in the background is around 20%. It'll probably take around 10 years after the detection of the gravitational wave background to measure it that well to be able to subtract uh, the isotropic component and measure the anisotropy. The measuring the anisotropy is very interesting because with, again, Morgan Nanez over the summer, we found that this level of anisotropy scales like one over the square root of the total number of sources. So you can then estimate that the total number of sources that contribute to your background um, is using this kind of technique. Um, and I'll be using SDSS-5 and even before then SDSS-4 to build these mock gravitational wave backgrounds. Um, this is just an example of how I would do this. Here I have the Mingarelli doll technique that does uh, redshift zero, which is what I just showed you. Um, we keep building our galaxy catalog until the strain that we compute is equal to the measured strain from pulsar timing ray experiments. And that'll tell us what the volume of the gravitational wave background is. That should also tell you what the number of sources that contributes to the background is. And you can estimate a lot of parameters this way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last thing I want to say is why this is important for planets. <clears throat> um, the, the CCA link here that you might not see in the lower part of the sky is bicep tube. Uh, and what I mean here is that we had a gravitational wave background uh, detection that wasn't really a detection. Uh, so this happened right before the LIGO detection was announced. Of course, we all knew what was happening. It was uh, not super hush-hush. This is a picture of the PDF of uh, the 11-year data. And you can see we had a loud signal at 10 to the minus 15 where it should be, right? So this is very exciting. Uh, we even decomposed the data set into six-month slices and watched the signal build up over time. It looks great. Then we changed the solar system ephemeris model and found that the signal disappeared, right? Uh, so now the signal is the link with CC is not bicep tube but planet. Uh, what we ended up finding and what our, our colleagues at JPL also believe is the case is that this manifested on an 11.3 or 4 year time scale, which is the orbital period of Jupiter, right? Uh, and so Jupiter has a well measured mass. But the masses of Uranus and Neptune are not so well measured. And they were perturbing the orbit of Jupiter just enough to make it uh, look like it could be um, a very strong gravitational wave signal. The way that it's related to the gravitational wave signal is through the solar system ephemeris. Now, the very center of the solar system needs to be measured to within about 300 meters. And to bring that home, it means that you have to balance the solar system on the tip of your finger to within about 300 meters in order to uh, do well enough to get rid of this uh, signal on its own. 
And so what we've done now is we've just added an additional error term that you can marginalize over, and we don't really care about this anymore. But it would have been um, a disaster if we had published this. So we were very, very careful, and we continue to be very, very careful uh, in our analysis. So I would love to talk about my work on primordial backgrounds, on cosmic string tensions, on fast radio bursts, and on strongly lensed AGN, uh, but Tim is Fujit. And I will leave my summary here. Thank you very much. So we had a lot of questions during the talk, and I'm sure we have a lot of questions also on our very first inaugural streaming on Zoom. But maybe we'll take just two questions since we're pretty short on time. Is your sensitivity mainly limited by the number of known good sources or the amount of observing time available for looking at those sources? Um, sensitivity to what? The background or the individual sources? Because the answer changes. Oh, really? OK, well, either. So the way that it works is that for the gravitational wave background, the best strategy is to observe all of your pulsars. It doesn't matter really how good they are, um, but you should observe them all as much as possible. But more pulsars is better. For continuous wave sources, uh, the individual sources, you should observe your best pulsars as much as possible to make the detection. So there's a different observing strategy for each one, which means that we then have to convince um, our radio astronomer colleagues in Nanograv what the correct strategy is to do through our models of the background so to say, look, we expect the detected background first. We should be timing everything as much as possible. Um, and then once we detect the background, we'll say, OK, well, maybe we should start to bring in things like Meerkat uh, and do high cadence observations of our best pulsars uh, in order to find the continuous source. OK, because it seemed like you were throwing away a lot of sources with some red noise. And the red noise versus white noise curve didn't, didn't look that different, right? It looked like the red noise ones had useful information. So the, yes, they, but not as much useful information. Yeah, so um, it's also a computational question. If you do a full-blown Bayesian analysis and you include all of the red noise terms for every pulsar, this quickly becomes computationally intractable. So we also have to make sensible cuts uh, in our data set in order to do the analysis. This is what we found. Okay. Any other pressing questions? So, so I should also say, Kara is here. She's around. So, you know, definitely sign up with her today if you can. She's the sign up sheet. But if you can't meet with her today, she's also around. What, you had one more. I mean, my question was sort of in line. If you could, is there any instrumental change that would help you? I think this is similar to what David said, but I didn't quite catch the full answer. So, like, on the GBT, what could they do that would help you? And you know, make these detections happen faster. Bigger dish, a bigger secondary dish, a <clears throat> camera. Um, so the detection of the background, right, um, requires monitoring all of your pulsars as much as possible. And so you would try to time all of them. Uh, it doesn't matter necessarily how, it's, it's more of a question of which pulsars you observe to answer which question. Now, um, for your pulsars that are OK, that have maybe, you know, residuals of 10 to the minus 6 seconds, not necessarily nanoseconds. Um, those are good to monitor for the background. And it, you can think of it sort of as a tsunami warning system, right? You want to have your buoys all over the place. Um, for the single sources, what you want to do is time them um, as often as possible. Um, so you want to have a very high cadence observations of your best pulse. So the, the residuals isn't so important for the gravitational wave background, but for the single sources, it's super important. And so the, the answer to your question is that the best observing strategy is to monitor all of the pulsars all of the time as much but as I'm possible. But I'm asking an instrumental question. I'm so, saying, how could you change the telescope to help you? Yeah, and oh. so um, this is something that I tried to uh, answer that, that David asked a little bit earlier as well. And that's uh, a very uh, active area of research. And we're still having discussions and, and arguments about what the best strategy is. So there's something called uh, NGVLA, um, Next Generation VLA where um, it's potential that they just park the VLA and then we just run it into the ground and just use uh, whatever information we can coming from that. It's more like if we had our, our dream telescope, it would be something like this for a kilometer, um, something like this. But of course, my European background is showing when I say things like that. Um, so the answer is not crystal clear right now. If the best thing to do is to have 
all of these lost 30 meter telescopes timing pulsars all of the time and and at what point does that become the best strategy and but then you there's a lot of things to take into account you know personnel power um, how you can even you know power those stations for that long things like this so the answer is not entirely clear so unfortunately we have to wrap it up let's thank you again